really nice that you you tell tell us something about yourself and okay. yeah talk about your work and your approach to to art and the idea of living outside the, the big city i grew up in connecticut my parents and my family are here uh so and i um and it is you know it is close to new york you know growing up here you always sort of feel like you're in the shadow of new york uh the city is like towering over you and uh looming everywhere there's this pull everyone sort of goes there and checks it out um it's got this kind of magnetic pull about it uh but i um i went to uh Boston for my undergraduate work, uh, which is the other way. So Connecticut's, you know, it's right in between these two big cities, um, but nobody really thinks about what happens here. Everyone just drives through. And I, I mean, I moved to New York after I finished grad school at UConn, where I met Ulu. Um, I went to New York and lived there for six years, so I had that, ex I had that time where I was really um, based there and doing a lot of projects. Uh, art projects in the city. I sort of, I did a bunch of um, um, different things with different nonprofit organizations down there. A um, place called Smack Melon. I did this program in the Bronx that um, gives artists a chance to, it's basically like a professional development program, artists in the marketplace, and they um, you know, they bring in arts professionals from different fields and introduce art, a group of young artists to them and help them figure out how to promote their work and how to, how to find opportunities to show their work and all that kind of stuff. And then we had a show at the Bronx Museum of the Arts at the end of that. That was cool. So I have, I have had that city experience and then at the end um, and, you know, by the way, I also, while I was there doing these programs, I met a lot of other artists, and that was, you know, great to be part of, a, to feel like part of a scene and a network that was, you know, definitely thriving, like, just thousands of artists in New York from all over the world, of course, and, uh, and, and not just the artists, but people. I mean, it's such a cosmopolitan city. It was very inspiring and um, I think it really raised the bar on my work for me to be there for a while to push myself to make better work uh, more ambitious work um, and to think about my work in different ways so I was really you know and I didn't plan to move to New York I sort of happened it happened by accident a little bit I I got a job there and I was at a time where um, I just wanted to try something different. I never saw myself living in the big city, but that's where I ended up. And then I stayed, for some reason, I stayed for a long time. For how long, um, did you say? Six years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's quite enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was enough. I wanted to get out. I really wanted to leave by the end of six years. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine because, uh, you know, in six years you, you managed to understand and see many things. It's enough to understand if the city is good for you or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's limiting in certain ways to be there because real estate is so expensive, it's hard to find space to make your work. Um, and I wanted to make, I wanted to do work that was more um, on the land and larger scale stuff. So um, it really made sense to come back to Connecticut at that point. Even while I lived in New York, I was coming back to Connecticut and making projects um, because I had a network here and friends and family and opportunities. So, um, like Ted and I collaborated on a project in Connecticut in like 2007, six. Well, actually, it went on for a few years, but it started in 2006. And I was already living in New York then, but I was coming back. To Connecticut, it was, I mean, it didn't really make sense. I was like driving back and forth two hours mm -hmm. to work on the projects, but um, 
but it was a good collaboration. I like Connecticut. I like sort of like the way that Connecticut gets forgotten about. Actually, there's something nice about that. That it feels like you can breathe here and still be really close to the city and and uh, swoop in there and do something. Um, see people do a project and then kind of go back to mm. quiet space where you can think. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's true. So, yeah. Colin, and then, so what is your approach to art? How do you work? And maybe you want to introduce some of your most recent projects or upcoming projects you're working on? Yeah. Um, okay, I, uh, <clears throat> I, I work in a lot of different media, um, but I do have a focus um, on engaging people. Um, kind of in a direct way um, so there's like a social aspect to what I do and um, sometimes I talk about it like social practice um, yeah it's, it's nice because this is what Lani told me Ted also was saying that it's very important for, for, for him too to have this kind of social life and to include people in, uh, yeah. in this work so this is something that uh, I see. Th I see a similarity already. Yeah, totally. I mean, mm. I think that um, I think that especially Ted and I, our our working process is kind of um, evolved at the same time in some ways. So I think that he and I kind of were influencing each other mm. and learning about these ways of working, and uh, and and it just was a natural fit for our our personalities also. So um, and then. So yeah, I, I, uh, I come from a really big family. I've always felt really social and liked people, liked collaborating. I like to, um, I like to, I like collaborating because it uh, makes me lose control. You know, like I can't um, be in charge of every detail of a project. I like ha having other voices come into things and um, interrupt. What I maybe what I was thinking about how I would direct something or where I would want the project to go. Um, does it doesn't make you feel anxious the idea of not being able to control everything? I mean, yeah, it does sometimes. Um, but I yeah, I think I also really like it. I like I like the class of it. <laughs> um, I sort of like the I sort of like I think I'm an, I think I'm kind of an anarchist. I think I like that unusual things happen, unexpected things happen. And so, yeah, for recent projects, I've been um, working a lot in the last couple years on um, doing a lot of research and experimenting a lot with um, working on different kinds of um, food production. Um, so my a <clears throat> focus, I think my creative drive has really shifted in some ways from um, making work that uh, is sort of based in material um, like mm, or making work that's like in a context of um, of art that maybe is more easily digestible or seen that way um, like, you know, I like it. Like in New, New York, I was doing a lot of work that was out in public space. Um, I was making um, vehicles. Like I had this tricycle that I was doing a lot of projects with. And uh, Ted and I made a boat that was on wheels, so that was a moving vehicle. I, I guess maybe the point is more that in the city there there's a there's a different sort of. Um, lifestyle so it's a way to engage the public directly on um, the street which I was taking advantage of like I was using the street as a venue for what I made and and as a as a place to for direct engagement with strangers and the public um, you know people that I maybe that were in my network but I would create event happenings that were on in in public space on the street um, so, um, 
that has shifted a little bit coming to Connecticut because I've been working more directly with the land and a really um, interesting kind of um, group of people around it that are just obsessed with the process of making maple syrup and, and tapping trees um, and getting the getting the water from the trees. You know, engaging with this process of syrup production really puts you in tune with the weather and with climate and climate change, thinking about climate change in this very um, direct way where you're really in tune, experiencing, worrying about what the temperature is, thinking about it constantly, because the, the flow of the sap in the trees is um, completely dependent on, on weather. And you, as, as someone engaging that natural process, you need to um, sort of think like the trees and feel what they're doing in this completely um, abstract but um, fascinating way where uh, it, puts, it puts you in tune with the, with the whole life of the trees. It's nice that you're telling me about um, this, uh, you, this work with maples, with the, yeah. the trees. So, yeah. so, but do you see it as, a, as an artistic process as well? Yeah, I have, um, I have some ideas about how to um, share the process with a larger public. Um, so I have, um, I'm, I'm making, I'm sort of in this proposal stage with that of trying to find a venue um, that would be appropriate and it needs to be a pretty specific type of venue. Um, I'd like to do it in, I think in a museum space. Um, and it needs to have, um, you know, basically a museum space with a hill with a lot of trees on, on the hill right next to it. How do you bring the trees there? Ah, so, yeah, that's the problem. I need to find a museum that already has wow. the trees that I need. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting you bring that up because there are people experimenting with producing maple syrup in a completely different way. Rather than, um, you know, generally what it's always been is you find trees that are already growing. There are people experimenting now with growing maple trees in a row, like yeah. any other yeah. agricultural crop. Mm -hmm. um, so you plant can a you, field Can you do of, that with maple maples? Yeah, it's, um, it's controversial, honestly. There's, there's people, um, there's like a university research program in Vermont that does maple syrup research, maple syrup production research. Like they do some of what they do is about the economics of it, um, but also the natural uh, processing of the science stuff. Um, but they uh, um, are experimenting with planting maple syrup in rows so that you would you would have a field and you would only grow the trees to be maybe eight feet tall or something like six or eight feet short, you know, mm -hmm. two or three meters. And um, cut them off at the top and pull the sap out of them. Yeah, well, what I want to do is make a um, foundation where the trees, it's very elegant. You have this tubing running through the forest coming down to a collection point where um, the liquid collects in some sort of vessel. And I want to make a beautiful vessel for that. I'm not interested in making the syrup so much as in a public way, although I'm doing that with my students. That I teach. I teach art at the university here. Yeah, is it good? The syrup you made? <laughs> Does it taste good? Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> um, but the water, like, you can also drink the water without processing it into syrup, and it's much more efficient. And um, you can still taste. You taste the trees almost more directly. It's this. The raw water is like a really kind of magical um, substance, and um, it's called, you know, it's called sap, tree sap. But I want to, um, what I, I think what I would like to do is have a, maybe a variety of different um, saps, because you can also, you can also tap other trees, and um, I think it'd be interesting to have like a tasting space mm. where you're taking the sap from different trees. Are they all good for people? I mean, are they all good for humans? Um, is it okay to drink these? Um, 
this syrup well, coming from other plants? Yeah, many of them are good. Uh, some of them, because of the, it's it's really interesting when you read about it. There's you know, all the different different trees have very different internal um, mechanisms for their life. So some of some of their internal um, workings are better suited to sap flow than others. Some of them are not don't have a lot of sap or it doesn't flow well or it's difficult it would be difficult to extract the sap from certain trees. Um, but there are a number of um, species of tree that people use currently around the world to to make syrups or to get the sap. Um, in Russia, they, they use birch sap. Um, in Alaska, also, they make syrup from the birch trees and um, walnut trees. Um. Do the trees suffer because, you know, for, from, from this procedure? Do they suffer, the trees? No. Um, yeah, it's done in a very careful way. Um, you know, uh, you don't... There's recommendations and guidelines about um, only making holes in trees that are large enough that they can handle the, um, the stress of it. Um, it's only you like you wouldn't you wouldn't um, tap a tree that's very young unless you wanted to kill the tree yeah. um, for some reason but um, generally it's it doesn't it, it the tree what happens is um, you drill a hole yeah. the sap blows out of the hole for about five or six weeks. And then by that time, the tree has closed off that area of the of the wood and sealed it up. And so you're creating little you create these little um, dead spots in the in the living wood of the tree, but it just grows around them and continues growing. It doesn't have any um, long lasting um, effect. On okay. Okay. And then, but can you do it frequently on the same tree, or only once a year, or how many times a yeah. year can you drill? Yeah, once a year. Once a year is typical, yeah. And that's um, it. For and then for the rest of the year, we, we you will not torture the tree anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. You give the tree a break after <laughs> you've taken some of its water. Yeah, um, but you said that you want to bring it to a museum, right? You yeah. would like to bring yeah. it to a museum. So how would you imagine it? How do you imagine to since it is a very long process? How do you imagine to develop this process within a museum? I would have a series of workshops that I would set up. Um, so there would be sort of a open invitation for people to come and be involved in different stages of the process. So um, and I've been doing. I did this uh, this past year at the University of Hartford mm -hmm. here, where I've been teaching. Yeah. Um, I I was making maple syrup on the on the grounds of the university, and um, so we did a we did a workshop where I taught people how to tap tr how to tap the trees and what that collecting what collect the collecting process how that's done. There's different ways of collecting, but some the old way that was typical is you put a bucket you hang a bucket on the tree yeah. and the water the sap drips into the bucket mm -hmm. so I made these bu special buckets that had a um, you know like it has like a spigot on it so you can open the bucket at the bottom and fill up a, a cup to taste the um, liquid mm -hmm. how many buckets um, do you do can you fill up with a single tree with a single tree mm -hmm. um, if it's a if it's a really big tree, you could put two or three buckets on it. Wow. Um, usually, it's one bucket per tree. If but if it's a big tree, you can do more. But I was you know I put this I put the spigot in the bucket so that that way people could um, taste it. And I and I've made a sign that invite you know inviting people to to try this the liquid. So this was right on campus. Lots of people walking around all the time. I, I did a um, I did a couple of other events over the course of the season so there were I had some people who helped me um, chopping the firewood and we were teaching them how to chop firewood the focus of of this uh, workshop I would call it workshop uh, was it uh, to, to taste uh, the syrup or or, um, or the or the entire procedure the first workshop was really just getting the collection started so you, you know we didn't we didn't process the syrup 
immediately you have to wait a while until you have enough sap that you can boil it down because to get like to get like one liter mm. of syrup you need to boil down 50 liters of sap wow. 50 to one yeah. so it's it's a lot mm. um, and uh, so we <clears throat> yeah but then there was another event I didn't get there yet but we, we had a pancake um, making festival where every it was um, BYOB bring your own batter so people brought their own pancake batter we made pancakes and the syrup was there we were making the syrup too um, and the, the syrup is made with on a wood with a wood fire so it has it takes on this flavor of the wood a little bit and the it's like cook you cook it down really slowly so it's develops this complex flavor of caramel and maple syrup production was done by the Native Americans that's that's where it came from that process was learned by the European settlers who came here mm -hmm. Um, from the Native Americans, they were already doing it. So, um, so at so, the end, you were you were doing these pancakes, and then you were eating these things, and then tasting tasting your syrup. So it was mm -hmm. a kind of a party. Yeah, it was a party, and we sort of had a competition about who who was making who made the best pancakes. Um, yeah, it was that was that was a great day. We had a lot of fun, um, and it was a nice way to share the share the process with everyone. But where are you inside of your home? Or yeah. are, are you inside? I'm home, yeah. Okay. Because it, there is so much light on your yeah. right side. Yeah, this is uh this is the porch. It's a nice room, lots ah, of windows. Okay. Some of the maple trees are right out there. 